and welcome to World Stories. I'm Sumi Somaskanda, and this is your International Reporters Magazine. Don't go anywhere because this week we'll explore the story of a mysterious book in the Australian outback. We hunt elephant poachers in Kenya before soaring with the monarch butterflies in central Mexico. All that coming up. But first, we start out with a trip back in time. Imagine Australia in the 19th century and the arid plains of New South Wales. This was a mining region, and a generation of pioneers arrived to settle the land. Some came from as far as South Asia and the Middle East with camels in tow, and traces of their heritage are still celebrated today. But the discovery of a rare book half a century ago raised more questions than answers in one town. Bill Code from Australia's ABC shines a light on that mystery. Straight through here. Bobby Shamrose knows this corner of Broken Hill like the back of his hand. Yeah, it's all the camel yards. This is where the South Asian men who arrived in the town late in the 19th century settled, bringing with them the stock that helped settle the bush. Bobby's grandfather was the last muller of this mosque. But there used to be heaps. You could say I could still see them here now. But there'd be dozens of them in here. You know, when you think about it, they've done a lot of good things for this country. They sort of got it on its feet, especially on the outback and that. You know, how else would they get the, their mail and their stores and all that out to them? Their presence is well documented, so when a large foreign book was found at the mosque in the 1960s, a label classifying it as a Quran was attached and it stuck for 50 years. It said on it in English, the Holy Quran, and I was like, ooh, you know, this is the thing that I read about, but I think it's in Bengali. Everybody had assumed it was a Quran, and she was the person that informed us that it wasn't um, because she could understand the writing. The book is kept with the Broken Hill Historical Society inside a restored synagogue. Any locals with the knowledge to decipher the 19th century work had long since passed away when it was found. Here on the edge of the Broken Hill Cemetery, backing onto the desert behind me, some of the town's Muslims have been buried over the years. And there are Afghans, Pakistanis, but there's nothing to suggest that any Bengali speaker was ever laid to rest here. The mystery of who brought the book was everything Samia had been looking for in a PhD subject. There aren't really Bengalis who are Camelese because Bengal's got no camels, it's full of rivers and Bengali people ne have never seen camels. It's just, it's just a, it doesn't make sense. Why are Bengalis there? Some of her findings suggest there could have been a whole community of Bengalis, their presence forgotten until now. It's a songbook. Um, so it would have been, it's, a, it's performance poetry, so the kind of way these books were read was people would gather, often illiterate people, and the one person who can read would sit there and sing it out. Just like other early migrants, the South Asians who came to Australia brought little pieces of home with them. A uh, pig. Tastes all right, too. Whether it was their favourite fruit or their favourite poetry, little pieces remain. Samia's doctorate is being adapted for publication as a book next year. In Broken Hill, Bill Code, World News Australia. Thanks to ABC in Australia for that story. Now to a simple but effective idea, protecting wildlife and the environment by working with local communities. That's the motto behind Wildlife Works, an organization that aims to find environmental solutions that make economic sense for people who live in the areas. One of the group's biggest projects is protecting and managing Kenya's Kasagao Corridor, a dryland forest that lies between two national parks. Wildlife Works sells carbon offsets and distributes that money among the locals, so they see the value of conservation. It's called RED, short for Reducing Emissions and Deforestation and Degradation. But as reporter Jürgen Schneider shows us, preserving the valuable corridor is far from easy. In the Kasigao Corridor in eastern Kenya, the bush stretches as far as the eye can see. Monitoring the land is impossible without aircraft. Since the place has become a nature reserve, the wildlife has returned, and with it, poachers. Forest rangers patrol the area daily. Helicopters are used to move the men around. Their aim is to stop illegal hunting. 
Hancock, as I can see from the app, I'm going to give you the GPS coordinates. More often than not, they arrive too late. The pilot has located another dead elephant and directs the men to it. It's the 30th elephant to be killed this year. The poachers use poison. It's more subtle than a gun. The poaching method which was used is a poisoned halo. They were using those poisoned halo. So it was eat from somewhere, it came and died here. It is not easy for us actually to find this thing the way it is. Hi, Eric. Yeah, fine, thank you, sir. Rob Dodson has been leading the project for 20 years and built things up from the start. How long do you think it's been dead? Illegal ivory poaching is a growing threat for the reserve. Demand for ivory has increased significantly in the last year, mainly fueled by increase in ivory prices in China. Price of ivory per kilo has risen from $10 a kilo to $100 a kilo. One of the biggest challenges we have is to make sure that revenue from the carbon project goes into the communities to incentivize the communities to protect the wildlife for future generations. At the beginning of 2011, Wildlife Works got permission to sell CO2 certificates to people who want to offset their carbon emissions. 20 years ago, the corridor was used as farmland and for grazing cattle. Now, the wildlife is back and the forest is recovering. Rob Dodson has expanded the conservation area in recent years. Each year, Wildlife Works plants some 50,000 trees on the edge of settlements and in places where the deforestation is worst. The protected area under the Casagal Corridor Red Project is about 200,000 hectares. There's about 100,000 people who live in and around that area. And at present market prices, which is about $6 per tonne, our 1.2 million tonnes brings in about $7.5 million to the project area per year. Wildlife Works has a permit to sell carbon offset certificates from the forest for 30 years. A third of the revenue goes to communities around the reserve. After two years of drought, the rains have finally returned. Farmers are again able to work their land. Resistance to the project has waned since the locals have come to understand that climate conservation benefits them directly. They really need money because water is in short supply. The reservoirs are hardly ever full. Many people were only able to survive the drought by relying on government aid. Well, the money that our community will get from uh, uh, carbon projects is 5 million shillings, and 80% goes to the water problem because people, our people are fetching water from rock catchments after the rains. After the rains, they are gone now, then we have got no water. People have to run up and down to fetch for water elsewhere. Hey, the smell? Yeah. Yeah, it's a fire smell. So, in the direction. Yeah, it's growing this side, so it must be somewhere down here. The search for fuel also drives the villagers into the conservation area. Charcoal is scarce. The farmers try repeatedly to fell trees in the reserve in order to make charcoal. Because they know it's illegal, they go deep into the bush to do it. When rangers discover charcoal pits, they destroy them immediately. As you can see, what I'm doing is I'm opening up this uh, jackal kiln, which, uh, we it, which we found it this morning. It has been put up by illegal charcoal burners. So when we open them up this way, it's one way of discouraging them coming in. But outlawing the practice and destroying the kilns is not enough, because the charcoal burners will just go elsewhere. Money from the project is being used to set up sustainable charcoal manufacture. Only branches are burned, so the trees can keep growing. Wildlife Works has developed a simple machine for pressing briquettes. Several villages in the region have already adopted the practice. A small garment company has been set up to let people earn more money. 
This is where the Wildlife's Works collection is made. But soon, the women here will be making clothing for a German sportswear label as well. Without the money from the Climate Conservation Project, a success like this would hardly have been possible. The communities in this area have historically been very reliant on subsistence farming, charcoal burning and bushmeat hunting. That's not sustainable as the population has increased so much. So we're using some of the carbon money to industrialize, to create jobs in light industry and in ecotourism to provide an alternative. Alternatives like this are important because the population continues to grow. The forest area at the foot of Mount Kazigao will only continue to thrive if the local people earn more money by maintaining it than by destroying it. An important model for other regions in Africa and the world. When most of us think of painting, we immediately think of cities like Paris or Florence. But what about southern Lebanon? That's where we head now to meet a grandmother who does more in one day than most of us do in a week. She farms her land, takes care of the family, and paints. In fact, her art is well known in the region, even if she doesn't always have the time to devote to the canvas. Al Arabiya's Adna Nalush has this story. Hamda Yaya has overcome difficult circumstances to pursue her artistic talent and bring in some extra income for her family of eight. She's been a farmer for 20 years. It's a tough existence. To Hamda, painting is a form of escapism, a creative contrast to the hard labor that makes up the bulk of her daily life. Art is a way of leaving all my worries behind, which I have a lot of, with children and grandchildren and many chores. There's so much more pressure than there used to be, more than anyone can deal with. If I had the time, just one day off, I would sit down and devote myself to painting. Hamda has been painting since she was a child, but the demands of daily life prevented her from studying art. She's completely self-taught and has never learned any formal technique. But the people in her village believed in her, thanks to their support her work, which often depicts local traditions, has become well known in southern Lebanon. The millstone means a lot to me. It was used in my aunt's day. I've included my mother in one of the paintings. We want to preserve our legacy. You couldn't burn yourself on the millstone and it didn't spoil the flavor the way modern electrical grinders do. That's because it doesn't generate heat. Hamda became increasingly well known. Her work has frequently been exhibited in the city of Sidon. Over the years, she sold a number of paintings for decent prices. Her husband never expected her to be successful. In the early days, he would tease her about her art. In the beginning, my husband laughed at me and told me I should stop wasting time. We were very poor at the time and I had to use oil from simple oil lamps, which irritated me. My husband doesn't like me telling this story. But now he buys me much better oil. It smells like flowers and doesn't bother me. I use a special oil to keep my paintbrushes clean. Hamda's favorite subjects are nature and Lebanese traditions. Despite her lack of formal training, her work resonates with a wide public. Over the years, the number of paintings she sells has risen steadily. But in summertime, she rarely has time to concentrate on her art. She's busy preparing the soil on her farm, a very time-consuming job. She tends to do most of her painting in the winter. 
I prefer to paint during the winter months. That's when I'm most inspired. In winter, the work that needs doing on the farm is less strenuous. You mustn't forget, I'm 57. I'm not as young as I was and not as tough. In the past, I would stay up half the night painting after a hard day's work outside, but I can't do that anymore. My eyesight has gotten worse too. It's not easy being a farmer and an artist, but somehow Hamda pulls it off. Despite the demands of rural life, she remains creative as well as practical. How can we integrate people with mental or physical disabilities into society? That's a familiar question the world over. In Moldova, a lot of children with disabilities are placed in large institutions where they have little hope of leading normal lives. But now the country is being encouraged to change that system through programs that offer youngsters who have grown up in homes the chance of a brighter future. UNTV's Christine Wamba has more. Born with a mental disability, Michal Skutari was abandoned as a baby and placed in an institution for boys with similar conditions in a remote part of Moldova's capital, Chisinau. He lived here for more than 20 years, until three months ago, when his life took a drastic turn. He's now living with a family in Tirsitai village. He's learning basic life skills here, including how to raise chickens. His new guardians, a farming couple, have two grown children of their own. They're pioneers in a program that offers foster care for children with disabilities. It was very sad. We consulted with our children and we decided to take Mikhail for one year so he can experience a real life. On a visit back to the institution, Mikhail is treated as a hero by his old friends. They bombard him with questions about the outside world. They can't read or write, and they have no opportunities to venture outside, so they're naturally curious. Have they taught you to read yet? Can you cook? Jorge Boy's institution is one of many for abandoned children in Moldova. It's secluded from the outside world. Sanya Saranovic of UNICEF says the existence of such places is a tragedy. Children with disabilities are invisible in Moldova. They are usually closed in institutional care without proper services, without education, any stimulation, uh, rehabilitation services. Some 80% of children placed in institutions like this one have living parents. They were abandoned after being born with disabilities or out of wedlock. Deputy Minister of Social Protection Vadim Pestrinchuk says the problem is endemic here. Unfortunately, we have inherited this, uh, inherited this system of residential care, of these big institutions from the Soviet past, when the, whole, the, the only policy existing at those times was if there is a child of adult with, or an adult with, with problems, the only place for, uh, for, it, for him is the institution. The United Nations Human Rights Office and UNICEF are calling for alternative community-based programs for people with disabilities. Navi Pile, chief of the UN Human Rights Office, wants the Moldovan authorities to modernize their practices. My office is exploring alternative ways of uh, addressing situations like this. Institutionalization is not the only answer. The United Nations wants institutions for children under three years old closed and more programs to help integrate people with disabilities into society. The biggest challenge lies in changing widely held misconceptions about people with disabilities. With more and more people willing to become foster parents, it's hoped that children like Michael may one day flourish in mainstream society, living full lives like everyone else. Here in northern Europe, birds migrating south are a sure sign that winter is fast approaching. 
But did you know that some butterflies also migrate? The monarch butterfly, which is famous throughout North America, heads south to Mexico during the winter months, traveling over thousands of kilometers. An achievement all the more incredible because none of the butterflies have ever made the trip before. Jesus Cardenas from Sistema Michoacano de Radio y Televisión followed their flight. This caterpillar will become a monarch butterfly. The species is famous for its lengthy migration routes. This particular butterfly is a very special one. It's part of the year's fourth generation of monarchs. Only the fourth generation can migrate each year because the first three generations die about six weeks after emerging from their cocoons. It knows instinctively that it should avoid mating and should drink as much nectar as possible and preserve its energy for what is one of the longest and largest insect migrations on the planet. The migration begins when about 5 million monarch butterflies gather in the skies to travel some 4,000 kilometers. They leave North America and Canada for the temperate rainforests of Michoacan in central Mexico, thereby escaping the freezing winters of the north. Their overwintering sites are conservation areas. Most of the monarch butterflies that have migrated south can be found in Michoacan. Their sanctuary is in a biosphere reserve best reached on horseback. Only one in five butterflies survives the hardships of the journey. But the millions that do reach their destination are enough to ensure the continuation of the species. The butterflies mate in spring, just before leaving their overwintering sites. Because larval food plants do not grow this far south, they must fly back north to places where the plants are plentiful. How these fragile creatures can survive such a long and arduous journey remains a mystery. They hibernate in the same trees each year. Somehow, the butterflies know when they've reached their destination, although the individual insects have never been there before. The migration of monarch butterflies is an extraordinary phenomenon, one that illustrates that nature does indeed work in mysterious ways. Wouldn't it be nice if we could all head to central Mexico during the winter months? That's all for this week's edition of World Stories. From all of us here and our partner stations around the world, thanks for watching. Don't forget, you can head to our website at dw.de forward slash world stories to watch this show again. We'll leave you with this week's Picks of the World. See you next time with more World Stories.